Hello, good evening. Thank you so much, as always, for joining me tonight for this video Bible study. Um, I hope and pray, as always, that you're blessed and encouraged by the end of, of uh, this teaching tonight. I um, want to just remind you and encourage you to please like and share this video. No matter how you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can like and share it with all of your friends and family so that they can uh, receive from this teaching as well. And uh, also remember to subscribe to our channel, subscribe to our page so that you get notifications whenever we release new videos and new updates of information. And also so you can get those reminders to join us online for worship on Sunday mornings. Um, so please subscribe and remember to, uh, to do that before you leave the page today. But thank you so much for watching. Um, starting a new four-week series that is called the, uh, the Road to Easter. And uh, in this series, we're highlighting each week for the next four weeks, beginning tonight, um, a different path or a different road um, as part of the Easter story. And um, what those represent, what those different points represent, and uh, how we can apply it to our life. And this first road is the road of the triumphal entry. And... Um, so we're going to be looking at the scripture from Luke 19, verses 28 through 40, and we're just going to be kind of going through uh, that passage of scripture uh, for a little bit. Now, you know, the Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, it set the stage for his crucifixion and ultimately his resurrection um, by declaring that uh, he was the savior of both Israel and the world, and that's what the triumphal entry represented. Now, this account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, uh, it's recorded in every book of the Gospels. It's recorded here in Luke. It's recorded in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and John 12. Um, and again, this event is known in history as the triumphal entry. I want to read Luke chapter 19 verses 28 through 31 it says this after telling this story Jesus went on toward Jerusalem walking ahead of his disciples as he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives he sent two disciples ahead go into that village over there he told them as you enter it you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden untie it and bring it here if anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Now, Jesus' command to his disciples to go into this neighboring village uh, near Jerusalem and find this colt that was tied up, waiting to be ridden for the first time, it, it plays out like prophecy. You know, in fact, this very method that Jesus would use to enter into Jerusalem would fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 9, which said this, Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10, it said, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. So here we see Zechariah chapter 9. This is the prophecy being fulfilled. Jesus telling them to go into a village and get a donkey or get a colt. Um, this was not just, you know, by chance. This was Jesus fulfilling this prophecy um, in, in Zechariah 9. So continuing on in Luke 19, verses 32 through 35. It says, so they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. Now, by this time, Jesus was extremely well known. He was well known by a lot of people, everyone coming to Jerusalem for the Passover uh, festival uh, had heard of him. And for a time, uh, the mood toward him was favorable by most people. Now, this, this phrase, the Lord needs it, was all the disciples had to say in this moment. And the cult's owner gladly uh, turned their animal over 
to them because they knew this was important. The Lord needs it. And so it, that's all it took was this command, this, this request, and they turned it over. Now, subjects of a king uh, were expected to make resources available uh, for use. And one example of this is 1 Samuel 8 and verse 16 when the Bible says that they threw down their garments and, and uh, they, they made their, their things uh, available for the king. Now the donkey's colt had never been ridden, so it was pure and it was suitable for a king. So there's a lot of symbolism in what's going on here. There's a lot of prophecy being fulfilled. And there's a lot of symbolism in this method, in what is going on in this story. Now Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem in this way was again a symbolic action. He rode a humble donkey rather than a war horse. Zechariah mentions those war horses, but he, he rode a humble donkey rather than a war horse to confirm that he was fulfilling this role of the Messiah by bringing reconciliation and peace. This is again from that prophecy in Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, that he would bring reconciliation and peace. He came on a humble donkey showing humility rather than the prestige and the royalty of what normally would be the entrance of a king. Jesus turned everything on its head. So continuing on in this story, Luke 19 verses 36 through 38, it says, As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Now, it says that the crowds, they spread their garments to give honor really, and to give homage to Jesus as royalty. One example of this from the Old Testament is 2 Kings 9 and verse 13 when it says that, it says, Then they quickly spread out their cloaks on the bare steps and blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. So this was something that was customarily done to uh, honor a king, to show that this is the king. When they throw their garments down and they put the, their clothes down so that the king can walk on them, this was a, a symbol of, of paying honor to a king. So basically what they were saying was, long live the king. Was This was the meaning behind their shouts because they knew that Jesus was intentionally fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9. Now, to announce that he was the Messiah, Jesus chose a time when all of Israel would be gathered at Jerusalem, a place where huge crowds could see him and a way of proclaiming his mission that was unmistakable. And the people, they went wild. They, they were uh, rejoicing in this moment and they were sure that their liberation was at hand. They were sure that this was the king. This was the one God had sent to free them from oppression, to free them from what they were going through. Now, again, the usual entrance of a king was this idea of a, a, vic, a victorious, conquering king entering a city. It was well known at the time. And typically, a victorious king came into a city escorted by the citizens of his kingdom and his army. And as he entered, songs were sung, praising, uh, singing praise and acclamation uh, of this conquering king. And he came with symbols, maybe even flags of his victory and his authority. And, and finally, he would come into the city's prominent temple and he would make a sacrificial offering to honor the gods and associate themselves with them. This was the usual entrance of a king, but Jesus, he turns this traditional entrance of a king on its head. And the gospel takes these well-known forms and, and just completely turns them around. Jesus entered Jerusalem again with a relatively humble uh, and, and really small escort and singing. And the only symbols of his power were a humble donkey and palm branches. 
completely different than what a typical king would come in to a city with. And upon entering the city, uh, he doesn't offer sacrifices, but he challenged the religious status quo and he cleansed the temple. So he didn't go in, you know, saying, oh, I agree with everything. Let me just associate with everything you're saying. Jesus went in and we see in later scriptures and throughout his ministry where he challenge the status quo of the church and the temple and he would cleanse the temple of all that was going on that was not being done in the name of the Lord. Now the people who were praising God for giving them a king, they really had the wrong idea about Jesus. Um, They expected him to be this national leader who would restore the nation of Israel to its former glory of the days of King David and King Solomon. And when it became apparent that Jesus was not going to fulfill their hopes, many people turned against him. In John 18, verse 36, it says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not of this world. Acts 1 and verse 6 says, So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? This is the apostles that were following Jesus. They're asking him, has the time come for you to restore our nation? They still have in their mind that he is this earthly king that come to establish an earthly kingdom. But in in the verse before that in John 18, 36, He's speaking to Pilate and he tells them that my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not a king that's come to restore Israel to its earthly glory, but I'm a king that's come to establish an, a heavenly kingdom that will never end. Luke 19 verses 39 through 40, continuing on in this entry story. It says, but some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. When they begin to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, these Pharisees, these religious teachers, they got angry, they got irritated, they got agitated, and they rebuked, uh, they they begin to say, uh, you know, teacher, why don't you rebuke your followers for saying things like this? This is blasphemy. They saw this as blasphemy that, that Jesus would proclaim himself the Messiah. We know he was. We know who he is. But these teachers of religious law and these Pharisees, they couldn't see it. So they begin to mock it. And Jesus replied in verse 40, he said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. We, we've typically read that scripture in the translation that if they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. See, these Pharisees thought that the crowd's words were, again, sacrilegious and that they were blasphemous. Um, They didn't want someone to come in and challenge their power and their authority, and they didn't want a revolt because that would bring the Roman army and the Roman government down upon them. So they asked Jesus to keep his people quiet. But one thing we learn here in this part of the story is the importance of praise. See, the crowd's praise made Jesus' enemies uncomfortable. It made them object to the praise being offered. It made them know that they were being defeated. See, nothing tells Satan and his followers that they have lost like the praises of God's people ringing in their ears. And this is what was going on as Jesus is riding into the city in this triumphal entry. He's being declared the king. He's being hailed as the savior. The enemy didn't like it. And he was voicing his opinion about it, but there's nothing that he could do about it. See, Satan loses because when God's people are really worshiping, their hearts and minds are on him and not on sin, not on self, not on Satan's distractions. When we're worshiping God and our minds are on him, that's when the enemy knows he's lost. That's when the enemy knows that he cannot gain any ground in our hearts and in our lives because we're focused on Jesus. Our eyes are on him. When Jesus was coming into the city all eyes were on him and the enemy didn't like it see the idea here when when he says the rocks will cry out this idea of creation itself praising God it might seem strange 
but the Bible uh, speaks about this in a few places. It says the trees, hills, the oceans, the rivers, mountains, valleys, cattle and creeping things, birds and fields all give praise to God. And there are some references in Psalms 148 and Psalms 96 of this very thing. See, Jesus said if the people were quiet, the stones would cry out. Why? Why did he say this? Why did he use this terminology. Uh, it was not because Jesus was setting up this powerful political kingdom, but because he was establishing God's eternal kingdom. This was a reason for the greatest celebration of all. Creation would worship him as king. Creation would recognize and celebrate him as the king of kings because of his mission, because of what he came to do and what he came to establish. Creation was ready to lift their voice in praise to God. I want to read you this quote from Scotty Smith from a prayer for Palm Sunday. He says, No other king would give his life and death for the redemption of rebels and idolaters like us. No other king can possibly make slaves of sin into prisoners of hope. Lord Jesus, you are that king, the king of glory, the monarch of mercy, the governor of grace, the prince of peace, the king of kings, and the Lord of of Lords. See what we see here in this triumphal entry again, this entry was the starting point. This was the beginning of sorrows, if you will. This was a glorious time to celebrate Jesus as King entering the city of Jerusalem. But the road ahead, the road to Easter, if you will, would be paved with sorrow and suffering and crushing and shame. And this was a moment to celebrate. This was a moment to see Jesus as this king coming to fulfill every prophecy, coming to fulfill every hope that had been had, coming to fulfill thousands of years of waiting. This was Jesus coming in and this quote sums it up perfectly that no other king would give his life and death for the redemption of rebels and idolaters like us. No other king would give his life for his subjects, but Jesus chose to do just that. Just that. And just like those people all those thousands of years ago when Jesus entered that city every day, we have to remember the importance of our praise to recognize Him and Him alone as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the importance of this section of the story, to remember that He is King, He is God, and there is no one else like Him. So, one other quote I want to read to you from N.T. Wright from Luke for Everyone. It says, as we arrive at Jerusalem with Jesus, the question presses upon us, are we going along for the trip in the hope that Jesus will fulfill some of our hopes and desires? Are we ready to sing a, song, a psalm of praise, but only as long as Jesus seems to be doing what we want? The long and dusty pilgrim way of our lives gives most of us plenty of time to sort out our motives for following Jesus in the first place. Are we ready not only to spread our cloaks on the road in front of him to do the showy and flamboyant thing, but also now to follow him into trouble, controversy, trial, and death? That quote sums it up so perfectly that here, here is this moment where people are ready to follow Jesus as a conquering king, what they thought would be a conquering king, this political, earthly king. They were ready to follow him. They threw their cloaks on the ground, celebrating him, thinking that he was coming to liberate them from this earthly power. But as Jesus began to walk out the mission of God, they begin to see that, hey, he's not exactly doing what I want him to do. And this quote says, are we ready to follow him? Not just when things seem like it's going our way, but when it seems like all hope is lost, when it seems like there's trouble and controversy and trial and death, and we will surely see that and talk about that in the weeks to come in this series. But are we ready to follow him at any cost? Are we ready to recognize him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in every situation? That is the application to us that we must see Jesus as the rightful King of life, as the Savior of all humanity. We must see him not as this earthly ruler who came to establish an earthly king, who came to take care of earthly political problems, but who came to establish an eternal heavenly kingdom that would never end. That is the king we serve, and that is the king we recognize in this story. Hosanna to the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We'll see in later weeks that this was the first road 
way to Easter, this triumphal entry of Jesus, our Savior. I want to pray as I close out this teaching that God would help us to remember who Jesus is, to praise Him in every situation, to praise Him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, to give Him His proper place in our life as King and Lord of all. Father, we thank You for Your goodness. I thank You for this Word. I thank You for the reminder of the triumphal entry that Jesus came in humbly, not as this earthly king, not as this conquering king like we would think in our earthly minds, but as a king who came to establish an eternal throne that would reign forever. He is a conquering king. Jesus, you are the conquering king of all kings and Lord of all lords. And today, tonight, we recognize you as Lord of all. We recognize you as King of kings. And we say just as these people did thousands of years ago when you entered Jerusalem, even now we say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Help us to trust you even when it seems like that things aren't going our way or you're not doing what we would want you to do or you're not liberating us how we feel that you should liberate us, but help us to find hope in the mission that you came to fulfill. God, help us to not be like these Pharisees who keep quiet and who refuse to praise you and refuse to see you and, and acknowledge you as king, but let us sing forth your praises every day. God, let your word and your praises be on our lips at all times. Let us glorify you, Lord, and help us to remember the importance of our praise. And God, thank you, Jesus, thank you so much for giving your life for us, for laying down your life for us, sinners and rebels and idolaters like us. God, you are the King of glory. Jesus, you are the monarch of mercy. You're the governor of grace. You're the prince of peace. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the King of Kings. This was the first roadway on the road to Easter, this triumphal entry. Let it be a reminder to you and to your heart that Jesus is King and He has come to save. He has come to set free. He's not come to be this earthly political King, but He's come to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords of all creations of a kingdom that will never end. Amen. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope again that you'll like and share this with everybody you know so that they can hear the message that Jesus is the King of Kings. Stick with me the next three weeks. Again, we're going to be covering different roadways and pathways on the road to Easter as we look ahead to Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to encourage you and ask that you be with us this weekend at 1030 a.m. here on campus. We're going to have service. We're going to have a worship service, and we want you to be a part of it. Listen, we appreciate whenever you watch online, and we're glad and grateful that we can bring our service to you online, but we encourage you to be with us in person. There's something real and tangible about being together with the body of Christ and worshiping together. There's just a presence that I believe is just so tangible when we come together and worship God together, but we'd love to see you in person at 10.30 a.m. this Sunday. But if you can't, and uh, if you'd like, you can watch online, same time, 10.30 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. We'd love to interact with you online as well. But may God bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you His peace. Until next time, have a great week. God bless you.